This week on Rockstar Superhero. Raphael Weinroth Brown is an otherworldly talent in a universe of exceptional musicians. Hailing from Ottawa, Ontario, Raphael discovered multiple genres of music through his parents' own musical influences. Almost immediately, Raphael knew what he had to do in his life, and it involved the woody resonance of the cello, an instrument typically found in orchestral work. But Raphael had other plans. I was thrilled to discover that Raphael isn't only a brilliant musician, but has the mind of a wanderer, always seeking and exhibiting the eloquence of a conservatory professor. He's a marvel and I deeply enjoyed our chat. I won't say much more, but I will imply that I'm pretty sure you'll be sold on this man, his fantastic talent, and the wizardly way he pulls unique tones from his acts of choice. This is my eye-opening interview with a Canadian musical master, the cellist, Raphael Weinroth Brown, on the Rockstar Superhero Podcast. Welcome to the show, Raphael. I really, really love what you're doing, as I said a second ago. And, you know, I, like I think most people, um, have discovered you because you were out on the road over the last couple of years uh, with Leprous. And um, obviously, you do a ton of work. You've been out there for quite some time, and you have other acts and, you know, things that you participate in, a lot of your solo work. And we're certainly going to talk about, you know, the new work you just released. Um, but you know, I discovered you when you were on tour with Leprous. I want to say back when, um, they did the 2017 or 2018, you did a tour with the, between the buried and me. Yeah. It would have been 2018. Yeah. We were in, uh, we were in the States twice that year. Yeah. 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 yeah in November that year, you actually toured with, uh, Haken. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, I I'll tell you this because I'm a, I'm a big, big, big Leprous fan. And what was wonderful to me is you opened the show and I knew a little bit about it ahead of time. Like, you know, I did a little sneak peek on YouTube, um, but you came out and you opened with this incredible cello solo that I don't think anybody was really expecting the first time you came through town. Right. And, and I'll tell you, I stood there and I cried and what a lovely way to open a complex show, right? With this complex, uh, very, very uh, romantic piece of music that ultimately ends with that rhythm thing that you're really sort of famous for the, you know, sort of a use of an echoplex or, or something like that. Right. Um, right. So you started with Bonneville and you broke my heart right off the bat. And ever since then um, I've secretly been, uh, a big fan and in love with you. So <laughs> for, for what's that worth? Um, how did that gig come about? Uh, it's a funny story. So uh, I was already a fan of Leprous a couple of years before I met the guys. And uh, um, so what happened was uh, I was offered this uh, support slot um, in my hometown of Ottawa um, for one of their shows. They were touring uh, the congregation yeah. in North America. And um, and I already knew the record and uh, I thought it was really awesome. And and I just immediately said yes to the gig. And uh, it was a kind of a crazy bill because, I mean, as you know, like some of these uh, North American tour slots, sometimes there's a lot of bands um, and there, there are already four bands on this touring package. Uh, and then on top of that, there were two local openers, including myself. So the show was kind of... Uh, a bit jam packed with, uh, you know, the number of people on the bill. And so I think the guys were just concerned that, you know, it was going to run late and, you know, they just wanted to make sure things were running on time. So, you know, I, I showed up and I figured, okay, they're probably going to want me to play only 20 minutes, you know, not, nothing, nothing too much because they need to keep things rolling. And, uh, so, uh, I, you know, the promoter came to me and said, yeah, the, you know, the, the guy from Leper says, you know, just, just play 20 minutes. And I said, okay, no problem. Um, yeah. So I was playing alone and playing my my own music and you know for sort of a local crowd. So I knew a lot of the folks there and 
And then uh, the guys uh, came down just to check to see that things were running on time and, and they were watching me and then I guess they, they liked it quite a bit. So uh, they told the promoter, oh, just let him play. No worries. Uh, so so I played for like half an hour and uh, and then walked off stage and basically they just asked me immediately if I wanted to play on the next uh, album, which was Melina. And I said, yeah, of course. I was kind of, yeah. it was sort of like, whoa, okay. Um, it all happened very fast. Um, but um yeah, they were just super nice. And, uh, uh, you know, we basically started communicating about working on that uh, immediately. And then uh, I went to Sweden uh, a few months after and we worked on that record. Um, and then, uh, but already when we were speaking in Ottawa at that show, uh, there was some talk about the possibility of having me on, uh, on a tour. So it was kind of like they had this long term plan already. Um, just based on like seeing me once, which was kind of crazy, but uh, it's been amazing. And uh, so that was sort of how that all came about. Uh, really, uh, really unusual, but you know, that's, it's like, it just shows that you just need to be, you know, be on the scene doing your thing yeah. and, and just basically, yeah, being yourself and being out there, even if, you know, it's a local support slot and, um, you know, it's you're maybe you're only playing 20 minutes or, or something like that. Um, it's it's just good to be there. And yeah, I mean, I'm happy I was, you know, it's it's led to a lot of amazing things. And they're they're great guys and incredible musicians. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been an adventure since then, for sure. You know, all the stuff that I've had the chance to do with those guys. So, yeah. Yeah. No, well, I mean, you're a fantastic musician. So that's a that's a great start. Right. But it is about preparation and constantly doing it and and not really expecting what traditional you know i guess the western society thinks that you know if if we play music we're doing it because we want to be rich we want to be a celebrity right you're actually doing it for the sort of the heart piece the the art piece and and doing something that gives you joy right well yeah i think it has to come from a place of honesty uh first I think, yeah, this is definitely a North American concept of you know, kind of making the big time. And yeah. I know here in Canada, for example, that um, a lot of people, uh, I think they view the musician as either someone who's like trying to make a go of it or their household name. It's kind of like this really, you know, black and white sort of you're either or. And for me, that's, that's very, very unrealistic in terms of, a, you know, perspective of how things really work because mm -hmm. there's so many incredible musicians who are uh definitely making a living doing it and they're doing just you know unbelievable work but many people will never know who they are and that's absolutely okay you know um it's not it's not so much about that and it's never been for me it's never been about making a ton of money or you know being particularly famous it's nice to be known i guess you know when you're making music and you're doing it as um you know as your profession and you're also making art and trying to get it out there and you've put your soul into it of course you want people to hear it but uh you know i'm also i'm you know i'm content with having the audience that i have i don't feel uh that somehow i need to be you know this huge musician either I, you know i just want to continue to uh satisfy myself in terms of what i'm creating and the quality of the output, you know, that I'm hopefully improving and or at least evolving in what I do. And that's much more important because if I feel like I'm not doing those things, it doesn't matter what kind of accolades or what kind of remuneration I get. Uh, I'm not going to feel really satisfied in myself. And I think a lot of musicians will will say the same thing. Um, so it's it's more about feeling like, you know, you're really improving and uh, sort of evolving in your craft and doing something that's that's nourishing and fulfilling to you. And then if it is, then I think it's, you know, there's a very good chance that the audience will be receptive and enjoy it too, you yeah. know, because they can always feel when you're really committed to making art and uh, putting your soul into something, particularly in a live setting, right? People right. can really feel that. And so you have to you know you have to give everything when you're on stage and you know just leave everything on the table so to speak and yeah uh not hold back uh i think that's just really important you know to be vulnerable and and to show that part of yourself and 
so yeah, you know, for me, those those things are, I guess, more my values, really. And and if if success comes of it, then great, you yeah. know. Uh, but that's something that I can't fully control either, and you know, I have to accept that, and um, you know, and not try to compare myself to other artists and think, oh yeah, you know, this person uh, is over here and I'm here and and so on, like that's not good you know that's not a <laughs> recipe for happiness and it's also no. not a recipe for good uh music making so yeah yeah no that's so true you know what i found interesting about you and what immediately caught me was you reminded me instantly of tori amos okay when tori sat down behind the piano the first time i saw her play was on the tonight show back in i want to say 91 maybe 92. And of course, I had never heard anything about her. I only knew about her through a friend of mine that had seen her at a record store. And, you know, so I went out and bought the album, not knowing a thing about her. And then she performed happily on the Tonight Show almost a couple of days after I think I bought the record. And I hadn't even listened to the record yet. And I was floored by mm. her. Um, she had just fallen into the piano. It's like, you know, she and the piano became one. Mm. And that's how I feel about you when you play. Maybe why it touched me so much because I knew Bonneville and you know, I knew the piece of music. I'm a drummer myself, so of course it's fun to watch, you know, Bard and, and the band in general because it's such a technical band, right? But mm. you brought this emotional piece that just resonated and I watched the audience. I don't know if you recall this in Seattle. I live near Seattle. Yeah. But you played a place called the Showbox. And That's right. Yeah. And it holds about 1,500 people. And there was this mass of maybe 100 Leprous fans in front of the stage who were there really honestly to see Leprous. I, I could not care. No offense to the, the other guys, but yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't there to see the deer hunter. I wasn't, you know what I mean? And, and you guys came out. You only played five songs. But yeah. Uh, when yeah, you... Yeah. yeah, when you started Bonneville, I, mean, I remember all this stuff, right? When you started Bonneville, the whole crowd came in. And by the end, you had the entire crowd in front of you, and you were the third opener. And it was just a mind blower to me. It, 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 I was just so happy for you. And and it's you, man. You're a huge component. So there it is. Thank you. you know? yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. it. That's, that's nice to... To hear that and it's nice to go back to that and try to relive it a little bit you know yeah. uh like those those shows feel a bit distant now but uh but those are really cool times and it's nice to hear that yeah there were a lot of people that that were there to see leprous too because i remember that that show or that that tour actually was um uh kind of a sort of a promotional tour right we were the support act and you know uh, I think not as many people knew about the band in the States mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just really cool to hear. Yeah. 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 Um, well, so if I may, and I promise mm -hmm. I won't get too personal because I promised you that in our emails. <laughs> um, but I would like to know a little bit about your origins because I think, you know, you're a perfect example of what I call the superhero, right? I talk about this a lot on my show. And it's the idea that, as an example, Spider-Man, he gets bit by a radioactive spider and it and it's his destiny, right? right? You seem to be sort of a cellist superhero. You, you know, bitten by this musical bug, this artistic bug. And I wondered how you were formed before that happened. Um, you know, a little bit, maybe a family history, but another thing is, you know, the etymology of your name. You know, it hmm. really means something. And I don't know if you come from a Jewish background, but, you know, for example, your Hebrew name is God has healed. And I know that's strange to even bring up in the, you know, in the context of this, but cello music, there's a resonance in a, in a deep, you know, it, it can hit everything, right? It can, it, it can be basically a baritone instrument. Um, up to you know a full soprano instrument, it hits every every nook and cranny, and it's such a resonant woody sound. Mm -hmm. There's a healing aspect to that particular instrument that doesn't that isn't harsh like say a bassoon even is, right? So, do you mind sharing a little bit about how you grew up? Yeah, sure. Well, I think one of the biggest catalysts for me uh, doing what I'm doing now was the fact that I grew up uh, hearing a lot of music in the house, but not because I come from a, a specifically musical family where people played instruments so much as just that we listened to a lot of records and had the radio on a lot. And 
I think that I was just exposed to a ton of music and a very wide variety uh, that I'm really grateful for because I'm very open to all kinds of music and I find myself now playing in a lot of different contexts, different styles. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would attribute a lot to that, um, just having yeah, grown up in a household where you know my parents were listening to a lot of different types of music and it was just kind of on all the time. Uh, a lot of different CDs and radio and and tapes and you know so i think that um and particularly music from different parts of the world you know non-western music that's like very much a part of the fabric of what i do now mm -hmm. and again i think i would trace it back to to that um and that in conjunction with you know hearing rock music on the radio and then having this kind of appetite for something a bit heavier and then you know wanting yeah wanting to hear the heavier bands and then uh, starting to explore metal and then becoming really into metal um, I would say that, you know, that was sort of my trajectory of hearing, you know, a lot of music from different parts of the world, especially the Middle East, India, um, Africa, you know, and uh, yeah, you know, heavy music, um, rock and, and also classical music, hearing a lot of classical music at home. But, but I don't think that, you know, I was brought up on classical music, like a lot of people that play classical instruments are, where it's very much... Um, that's kind of the gospel, you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. for me, like, it's it's just one style of music. And there are some, of course, you know, incredible masterworks in that realm. But um, to me, it's just one of many, you know, and I don't feel connected to any of the dogmas around classical music and the feeling of, you know, uh, I think within that sphere, there's this idea of it being kind of as a serious music and other things are like, oh, that's okay, but you know, right. it's not serious. And that's something that's always bothered me a lot. Um, you know, for me, it's it, it's like anything, right? There's classical music that I really love and, and other things that I uh, don't care for so much. And I would say the same for a lot of styles of music, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so I think, you know, exposure to a, a wide variety of music. Um, and then, you know, my my parents asked me if I wanted to take piano lessons. And I said, oh, I want to play cello. Um, and wow. uh, I, you know, I'd heard cello music on records before and I liked it. And it was just, it was just different. That was the main thing for me. I've, I think if there's something um, that everybody's doing, uh then i kind of I run tend away. To, yeah yeah like okay i'm not gonna do that uh, yeah. i'm gonna do something else so um that uh that was my decision you know i said okay i wanted to play cello but i didn't really know where that would take me and i didn't know how seriously i would take that instrument you know and i mm -hmm. learned other instruments along the way as well you know i just i was curious and i played other instruments you know throughout my teens and stuff but um i think that because of the cello being so unique um and different it became sort of like a valuable tool for me so that um i was i was forced to find my voice with it because it was the thing that everybody needed so you know i, I went through school and there were um and you know i was in like youth orchestras and stuff growing up and i was always again trying to like find my own voice something that nobody else could do or wanted to do i guess yeah. um and so i would improvise a lot i would you know on the breaks and stuff in the orchestra, I would, I would just improvise on my cello and I just play this modal stuff, you know, and like a uh, Middle Eastern sounding stuff. And I would, yeah. you know, try to play some riffs. And I remember at the beginning, it was really hard um, because it requires like this very developed technique to play things that might be like a little bit more straightforward on guitar, for example. Um, so at first it was a little bit more frustrating because I felt like I hadn't really mastered it. But as I got better, then I started to kind of figure it out more and and kind of understand maybe like a vocabulary that I could use on the instrument that was more my own. And so by the time, you know, I was in uh, university studying music, then I felt like I could really start to deploy that and, and write my own music and um, uh, try to do things that were kind of in a way rooted in the classical style of playing, but um, they were branching off and, and I was able to kind of find uh, my own form of expression that way. And one of the ways I did that was just retuning the cello and uh, finding these new kind of sound worlds in it because it's very uncommon to retune. Uh, I think it's just that, um, you know, most instruments don't have machine head pegs. They have yeah. like just uh, just the wood pegs, you know? And then, you know, getting a cello with, with actual gear pegs and it was like a game changer because, 
then all of a sudden I could do that, you know, uh, very easily. Yeah. And so then I could write this repertoire of music with uh, different, uh, different tunings and really sound very different, you know? Yeah. And I think for me, like that aspect of danger and, uh, you know, and risk doing something that sounds like you're, like you're going way out into orbit, you know, and very far from your sort of home base, that was like always really exciting and still is yeah. um, just to see where you could take it. And uh, so that was kind of the root of it, I would say. But also, um, yeah, in university, I, I started to get a lot of work, you know, doing sessions and, uh, you know, playing with different bands. And so I would go to school and, and play classical music and then I would play these gigs in the evenings and and uh, I was freelancing and I just found myself playing all these different types of music that I didn't think I would play, you know. Uh, yeah and that I didn't necessarily listen to. So then I was having to constantly find ways of making the cello sound like maybe another instrument because there wasn't another instrument available. I thought, okay, I wanna think kind of more um, in terms of the full orchestration, what would be um, interesting for this piece of music? What could I contribute to it with my instrument that I have with me right now, You know, not a different one. And that really forced me to, to try new things and be versatile and uh, and I think that that's something that I, one of the things I enjoy the most is being a bit of a chameleon and, and getting asked to do different things and sort of contributing uh, a really a different voice in, in different circumstances. So that it's almost like maybe you don't recognize that it's me across these different things. And it just feels refreshing, I guess. Um, yeah. So I guess I, I drifted a little bit off of your, your no, question, but, uh, but I guess that's a little bit of my trajectory in a nutshell in terms of choosing the cello and then sort of where it's taken me and uh you know who knows where it's going next but yeah no that's awesome well you gave me such an eloquent answer you you got the juices flowing now so my brain has all these other ideas and questions all right <laughs> awesome. we probably don't, don't have time for but i i, I want to say that that actually that eloquence clearly matters right because i i think that any any person with a with a really great vocabulary and a really wonderful way of expressing themselves can only find more power in sitting down behind an instrument, especially when they want to know it as much as you wanted to know the cello. Mm. And, and to me, no wonder it speaks the way it does because the intangible, Raphael, is you, right? You've, you've basically taken a sort of a sat, you know, traditional instrument that a million people in the world currently play and you've made it unique. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if someday soon you've got a locking nut and a tremolo and you're, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're playing with, good, with a, you're playing with a pick. I mean, it's just yeah. such a, it's such a different approach that you have. It's not just that you're cool or that, you know, you throw your head back because you're into the music. I mean, you really, really thought about how you approach the instrument in a new way. It's almost like you see the cello from an angle that none of us see it. And, and being able to pull that sound out of it, I think is really special, right? I mean, I get it. I keep saying the same thing over and over again, but I, I just, I'm, I'm kind of floored by who you are because you're so clearly capable of explaining exactly how you think and that's really rare hmm that's interesting i appreciate it yeah, yeah. thanks i mean yeah. i think over time you start to get to know yourself better of course but also you know not just from a personal standpoint but a musical one and and you start to understand what it is that you have to offer and you know you try to refine that and uh and you observe just from experience you know the more experiences you have uh within your musical life the more you you learn kind of what your narrative is and what you're meant to be doing uh with with what you have to offer with your music so um yeah i think i've gotten to know that better uh but uh at, at the end of the day i think a lot of it comes down to um yeah you're showing up but then you're surrendering you know and uh sort of letting uh, letting the music take over a little bit and, and not trying to control things too much. Uh, that I think that's when a lot of the best stuff comes out. And yeah. uh, I've really seen that a lot um, through improvisation, which has become not necessarily by design a big part of my career and uh, 
uh, a big part of what I do. Uh, and I love it, you know, and one of the things I like about it is that it's so akin to everyday life. You know, we don't, uh, we don't have it all planned out. You know, maybe we have some kind of schedule, but we're improvising all the time in real life. Yeah. So when people tell me, oh, I can't improvise, I'm like that's bullshit. You know, yeah, yeah. of course you can. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're doing it all the time. Yeah. You know, basically you're a virtuoso of improvising in life. Yeah. Um, although some people are more comfortable, I think, uh, sort of throwing caution to the wind than others. But we all we all do it all the time. And for me, it's just it's about uh, being receptive to the moment, you know, the, the sort of stimulus in the moment, I guess, and and having big ears and, and sort of being open to things as they come, uh, that's very special. And I think it leads to some of the best stuff. And I think that a lot of the work that I've put out that is improvised um, seems to connect with people the most, uh, which I find really interesting. But I think it speaks to the authenticity of um, those performances that are captured in the moment um, and that you know, there's there's nothing apologetic about it. It's it's not like, oh, sorry, I, I did this. Okay, I'm going to correct it. Yeah. Um, it's just okay. That's exactly what happened then, and you're reliving it through the recording or through the performance that you're witnessing. Yeah. Uh, so so it's something that I want to kind of continue doing and and continue exploring, um, specifically with with cello because uh, it's so. Um, I think it's so unusual to see that uh, that type of music making, you know, spontaneous, uh, uh, free music making in that way being done on cello in the same way as other instruments where I feel like it's explored more deeply. Um, yeah, for example, you know, I grew up listening to a lot of Keith Jarrett, uh, you know, playing oh, wow. you know, these, these amazing, you know, solo piano concerts yeah, and just yeah. being blown away by, you know, these, it's like a full opus and it's it's like just, you know, is absolutely incredible um, to hear that and to think about the amount of music that's just coming out of him, just pouring out of him, you know, seemingly so easily. Uh, yeah. And that's just so inspiring, you know, to be able to build something from zero, basically, and then create this whole world. And yeah, so I always, I always kind of think about that a little bit, you know, not not that I you know come anywhere near that, but just that it's it's an inspiration to think about that approach, uh, you know, when I play and but to try it on an instrument that's so different, that's not polyphonic yeah. in that way, and uh, and to figure out what's possible to make it completely immersive and uh, to you know, so it's like you're kind of putting on the goggles and you're in the landscape now. You're sort of in that uh, world, and uh, it's all being sort of built up for you as you know as you listen. So yeah. Yeah. It seems, I mean, for me, it's just, it's clear that it's like a, it's a competence thing. It's a confidence thing. And it's a ballsy thing. You really, <laughs> you really need to kind of jump off a cliff because you're not going to discover, because I think that's what it is with you. Mm. Yes, you're creating and yes, you're building your repertoire and you're building your skills, but you're looking to discover something that is uncharted mm. and and I can t I can feel it, you know, and mm. and I and again I'm not going to compare myself to you, just like you wouldn't compare yourself to Keith. But as a musician, and I'm a percussionist, as a musician, I recognize the search, mm. you know, I recognize yeah. the 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 complexities and the things that are hidden in the nooks and crannies of your music and where you're going for subharmonic, right, right, almost not that you're pursuing it, but that you're kind of hoping. That there's mm. these beautiful happy accidents that contribute to the piece yeah you're searching for these moments yeah um well you know i have this piece rich arcare which you know which literally means in italian right to to seek or to search and yeah, yeah. um and that's that's an old form uh you know from from the baroque uh you know period uh an instrumental form and i feel like that whole piece is kind of it's like this pursuit of something and it's going through all these different uh, sort of mini movements, you know, with um, sort of these different figurations. Like it's starting off, it, it begins with this kind of very free uh, intro, like very singing with almost like a recitative sort of with these, uh, uh, you know, these plucked chords and then sort of a, a bowed answer. And then it goes into these very fast riffs and then some arpeggios and then, and then some more riffs. And then it sort of has this uh, final, very uh, sort of grounded conclusion um, and it's like, yeah, you're in search of something and you're, you know, you're looking for, uh, for that moment that, um, is going to sort of 
fulfill you. It's this, this moment of musical consummation that lasts very, you know, a very short period of time, but it's worth the search, you know, yeah. in yeah. itself. And, um, and that piece is actually, I haven't really spoken to anybody about this, but um, it's, uh, it was kind of inspired. Yes, yeah, so you're the first person to hear this, actually. It's kind of inspired by this piece yeah. by um, Isai, uh, the, the violin composer, the great violinist, um, L'Obsession, you know, The Obsession, um, which is, uh, you know, again, it's based off of Bach, actually. Um, you know, it's, it's like he's kind of created his own piece out of this, this little Bach motive. Um, but it's got all this kind of all these arpeggios and it's it's kind of um, it's, it's, again it's it's sort of like this uh, sort of flying animal it's sort of searching for something and it's very virtuosic and very chaotic in a way and uh, so that you know older piece really influenced me a lot in writing this and trying to kind of put a, a maybe a more modern slant on that you know with the cello but um but again that type of music i think has a lot in common with improvising and um yeah this feeling of uh just yeah as you say going for it um and committing to a decision uh, that's really important to not hesitate it, you know if, if something happens even if it's not what you expect you have to commit to it um and uh, not not look back you know it's yeah. like you're only going forward so yeah yeah yeah, no, that's that's wonderful. You know, uh, I don't know if you know him personally, but Jurgen Munkeby from Shining in Norway. Yeah, yeah, he's a buddy of mine, and oh, awesome. uh, and and now you're my new friend, right? But but I guess what I'm trying to get at is uh, bringing him up is you remind me of him, mm. and I'm not not to say that you were influenced by him because I don't know how much you've really listened to his work, you know, or you know maybe Yagiazis from 25 years ago or something like that, but. Um, what I love about his style and approach is it's singular and it's almost aggressively violent in his pursuit of something unique mm. and his, and his total, I don't give a fuck about what culture says, you know, whether it's local culture, music culture, you know, heavy metal culture, whatever it is, he's just willing to be him regardless. In fact, I think not only embraces it, but runs toward dissonance, right? Mm. Dissonance with people, dissonance in music. Uh, do you do you have that same kind of approach that that it's kind of a all bets are off? You I know? think I think if you're uh, yeah, if you're stepping on stage and you're doing something uh, where you don't have a plan, then definitely. But I think just in general, yeah, you have to kind of um, throw caution to the wind a little bit and. Uh, you know, depending on the situation, but I think it's really better to take a risk. People feel it more, you know, a lot of people talk about kind of like playing it safe or being a bit conservative, you know, sometimes holding something in reserve. But mm -hmm. I don't think that really translates. Like, you know, maybe the performance will be like impeccable and sort of seamless, but I don't think that the audience is really there for that. I don't think that audiences go to concerts so they can see someone sort of get off scot-free. Right, right, I, mean? right, right. I think, I think they go there to feel like they're, they've been reminded of the fact that they're, you know, everybody here is human and that we're all kind of living this experience together and it reminds them of their humanity and um, yeah, of a deeper part of themselves that maybe yeah. they're repressing or that they're not fully acknowledging. And I think that art kind of, helps to unlock that a little bit mm -hmm. and open people and uh, and make them think about things that maybe they wouldn't have thought of or take them places that you know they that are that exist for them but they're not really tapping into so for me it's like I think it's about being a sort of medium for that mm -hmm. um, and uh, and definitely like I said before there's an aspect of surrender in it and uh, that involves a certain amount of confidence but sort of um, letting yourself uh, go almost in free fall. Uh, you know, this isn't always successful, but, uh, but you have to try. And it's interesting that, you know, we, we uh, began by speaking about the, um, the leper shows and those, those intros because they were pretty much exclusively improvised, at least a good part of them, especially on that tour with uh, BT Bam and the Deer Hunter. Um, 
they were really uh, improvised. So, uh, you know, to be honest, like that show in Seattle, I have, I have no recollection, barely any <laughs> recollection of what I did. You know, right, right. I, I just, I remember the experience. I remember the crowd, mm -hmm. but I don't remember really anything of what I played. <laughs> yeah. No, so, I mean, uh, it, 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 well, I don't re recall so much what you did is, is that it was evocative. Right, that it that it that it was penetrating, that it that it that it hit me not in the gut but in the heart, and and of course I remember that don't do dun 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 right dun, yeah, yeah. Dun, because of course that's the lead into Bonneville right yeah but but the rest of it it doesn't matter because it was so touching it was so singular and it was such a moment that's what drew everybody in they mm. weren't just saying oh the band is starting they were saying what's going on and how come yeah. I'm missing out, right? I've got to, I've got to see this. And I, and, and, and that's so rare, you know, that is so rare. Um, I, I, I can't, I'm sorry. I can't stop gushing about it. It was really, really lovely, but it makes me think of something and something you said a moment ago, and I would love your take on this is um, this happens to me a lot. So I'm, I'm wondering if this does with you, it seems to me that most musicians we spend a lot of time when we're not, you know, practicing or we're doing things that are artistic or, you know, meaningful to us. We're sitting around thinking about what can mm -hmm. we do that's artistic and meaningful to us. Yeah. We have this sort of unintentionally self-serving narcissistic sort of point of view on life. And, and we, we don't sleep well, typically. I don't know what your sleep patterns are, but I mean, I don't think I've ever slept a full night in my life. I mean, when I was a little boy, I had, you know, earworms. I'd have like McDonald, the McDonald's theme song stuck in my head at eight years old. You deserve a break today at McDonald's, you know, okay. bad, bad jingles and things. It yeah. just gets stuck. Yeah. So, so here's my question. Mm -hmm. um, artists seem to overthink everything, right? But I found that when it comes to your heart, you can't over love you cannot. It's impossible right. to over love. And for some reason, music, and for me, selfishly talking to you today, your music does that to me. It penetrates my emotional center mm. and it changes me. It doesn't just take me on a journey. It's, it doesn't release me. It holds me to you and it forces me almost to become like a fan and, and to fall in love with a, a sound because I desire the endorphin rush and the pleasure that comes from that sound. So what's, what's your take on that? Well, <laughs> well, thank you. First of all, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's definitely it, being an artist and and kind of living this life uh, involves and you know coming back to what I was saying earlier involves a certain degree of obsession and right I think that to get to a certain point like to not sort of give it up and say oh well you know I did that for a little while now I'm doing this um, or just at least to be thinking about it constantly and and doing some creative things in relation to it that requires a certain degree of obsession. And it's like the obsession you have when you fall in love with somebody for the first time. And, you know, that period of just, it's like, that's the main thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. And um, except that, as you say, you, you can't over love it and it never goes away. So it's the thing that makes you, yeah, the, the thing that gets you up in the morning or, you know, prevents you from sleeping at night. And it's the thing that drives you, um, even when it sucks. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know what I mean? So and true. So, it's this feeling of like, a lot of people uh, say, well, you know, you love to do this. So it doesn't matter. And other, other stuff matters, you know, the, the, the money thing or what all that, that kind of stuff. I say, well, yeah, but to love is a choice, but it's deeper than love in that sense, because it's like, it's like, uh, I don't want to say addiction because addiction has a negative connotation, yeah. but it's definitely obsession. It's yeah. something that, uh, it's just it's so much in the front of your mind all the time that you really can't let go of it. And you need to be doing it to be healthy also. Purpose. Doing, yeah, exactly. It, yeah, it gives you a sense of purpose. And when you're not doing it, you feel like you're in a bit of a limbo. And uh, I think that uh, playing an instrument, you know, is cathartic for us, even if it's not necessarily productive. You know, when you have those those times when you, you don't play a lot and you're feeling something, something's missing, and then you just play a little bit and you say, oh, yeah, that's what was missing. 
you know, um, when you have yeah. had a break from playing or you've just been doing other stuff or something, and then you just play your instrument and it's uh, the, the physical experience, the sound, the relationship with the instrument, the tactile, you know, when you're, when you're playing an instrument, you know, with singing, I think it's like, you know, it's a, a feeling in your body that you get. Um, I don't know that as much because I'm, I'm not a singer, but, uh, you know, there, there's this kind of, uh, this kind of feeling that like you needed to just nourish you like you know just like being hydrated or yeah. you know yeah. uh, you know that you just need to have the vitamins have that. <laughs> yeah you just need that you know otherwise you start it's like you're this plant that's just wilting you know yeah and yeah. so so it's essential it's like our life force but it's also this obsession that can drive us crazy and make us sometimes a bit unhealthy so yeah. you know what i mean but it's just a sort of a necessary thing like it kind of owns you, you know, that path lives you, so to speak. Yeah. And you, it's like your responsibility to, again, be the, the conduit for, for those ideas and for those emotions to come through in, in your, uh, your medium. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 The audience, well, the audience needs you. They just don't know it. Right. 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 right? It's a, it's really, it's, it's an amazing interplay between, you know, the performer and the receiver, you know, um, a question I've been wanting to ask you, and I mm -hmm. and I'm sure this has not happened to you yet because you're a young man. Um, but like the superhero story, you know, in Spider-Man, he gets his powers and he's running through the streets and he's doing all his stuff, and then one day he decides to let a robber go because it's just, you know, I'm tired, man. You know, <laughs> yeah. and that robber goes to his house and kills his uncle. Right. And it changes his life forever. Yeah. Um so when I think about the musician's story, I think about there's a stage where we hit, where we've, we've practiced, we've played, we wonder if we're ever going to break, all those little things, right? That when am I going to matter? When's the world going to pay attention? You know, do I count as, is, you know, am I in my purpose, all that stuff? Um, but other times, you know, it's family tragedy or some other issue that kind of mucks it all up. Um, have you ever considered quitting or slowing down or just saying wow i'm not in my purpose at all like i maybe screwed up uh well I'll, I'll i'll mention a couple of examples of things i don't think it's gone really that far i think it's always been very central to my life in some respect i've always found different ways of working on music and different avenues to keep myself i think from going totally insane you know yeah. to have these uh not to put all the eggs in one basket basically but yeah. uh there's moments where, yeah, you're, you're kind of burnt out and happens to me a lot. You know, uh, beginning of the pandemic was a good ex example where, um, actually we had just finished a leprous tour. Um, we had gotten back from, it was not a very long tour, like three weeks and a bit in, in Europe, uh, and then got back and then, you know, the, uh, yeah, the coronavirus situation was starting to get serious. Like people were starting yeah. to take this quite seriously, got back to Canada. And then immediately I, I had like some traveling gigs here. Um, where I was going back and forth for the next week or so. And that was pretty intense. So I was still traveling even after getting back from tour. I had one night at home and then the next morning I was gone again. And uh, and then, you know, then we were in lockdown and everything just kind of, you know, came to a halt. And I realized, whoa, I'm tired. And yeah. I, I took a couple of weeks <laughs> and uh, I didn't I didn't play any cello. I played other instruments, uh, just kind of focused on that. And uh, I just slowed down you know, and I just, I really, it took stock of where I was at, how I was feeling. And, um, and I just felt no pressure to do anything with any kind of urgency, really. It was just more a question of sort of exploring myself a little bit. Um, because there was no expectation, but normally people are always like, Hey, so do you have this thing ready for me yet? Um, yeah, yeah. you know, cause I do a lot of, a lot of sessions, a lot of contract yeah, yeah. work, and I'm involved with a lot of people and, they're all excited to have, you know, the thing that I've been working on for them. So that's awesome. But sometimes it's like, you know, um, so I just took a break from all of that. And, and no one was really expecting anything at that time. And I felt no obligation. So for a little while, I kind of stepped back a little bit, at least from sort of professional music work, but not not really that much. It was like a couple of weeks where I, I wasn't, you know, super on the ball or trying to trying to do anything uh, particularly industrious. Uh, and then, the, you know, there's moments where I've had a really hard time, maybe on stage, for example, like very okay. frustrating and felt like, you know, really wasn't a good show for me or that somehow I wasn't able to translate my ability to play something 
and that, you know, I messed up a bunch of things and it was really tough and, and I'm quite hard on myself. So I would get off and, and, you know, just not, not be able to sleep that night and just feel like, Oh, should I even be doing this? You know, yeah. like what a failure, you know, it's like, it's like, I've tried really hard and I can't even do that, you know? So <laughs> right. <laughs> like, it's like, like everybody in the audience is a cellist as well. So, I mean, there's this assumption that, oh, they all just, they're judging me. I, 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 I didn't play that chord correctly. Yeah. The, yeah. You know what I mean? I imagine it's awful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. You bring up a great point there because as somebody who went to music school, you know, I went to an arts high school and then I did six years of music school afterwards. And, you know, it, when you're like at university or conservatory, for you know an instrument and you're studying classical music you're just around musicians all the time and you only play for musicians when you're there yep. like everybody in the room has an opinion and is also grinding really hard on their instrument and knows the repertoire and all that stuff you know they have the score in front of them literally as well right. often they're following along so um you have this feeling of constantly being scrutinized by people who are experts yeah. And and also playing for teachers and, or people who are more senior than you, you yes. know, especially when you're starting and just feeling like everybody knows more than you. And at first that was, I mean, at on one hand, it was a great motivator because I improved very quickly. But then on the other, it was, uh, you know, it was a bit traumatic because I was taking that impression into the rest of my uh, musical life as a performer yeah. and playing in front of people, kind of projecting the same thing. Yep. Um, and... Uh, I had to kind of teach myself uh, to think about it differently. And I think as I gained confidence, I first of all, I started to think, I started to kind of flip it around. So I said, no, everyone is thinking that you're rocking it right now. And I was yes. projecting that. And then all of a sudden I got this big boost. But, but uh, and that's hard to always manifest that in your mind. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's possible, you know. Um, but I think as you as you perform more and there's kind of more evidence of, how people normally respond to the way you play, then you gain confidence. And the other thing is to not attribute too much authority to your audience, because uh, in a lot of cases, especially you know when you play your own music and it's not by, for example, somebody else, uh, they're not the experts you think they are, you yeah. know, and they're there to enjoy music. Um, and there's things like, you know, what time signature you were playing in this part or um, whether it was supposed to change this way or that way, or did you play these notes in tune or was this part rushing? Like all that kind of stuff. Like, it's like, you can't expect that the audience is going to always know all that stuff. And, yeah, and if they, they do, don't. if they do, then good for them. But it's yeah. like, most people are not going to come down on you for that, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> this, yeah. this type of, uh, sort of like you're in the art gallery standing at a distance and, and sort of, you know, being a critic. Uh, it's like people are there again to let themselves go and, uh, you know, be immersed in the experience and to really feel it. Otherwise it's not as much fun, you know? And yeah. for me, it's been also challenging as a, as a spectator, you know, to attend shows and to not kind of still be at work, you know? And I think that's why a lot of musicians, like, I think I remember Stephen Wilson saying this, that, you know, he didn't go to a lot of shows because it was kind of like being at the office on your day off, you know? And I totally get yeah. that. Yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't listen to music as an example. I mean, almost, almost never. I listen mm. to, you know, talk radio, podcast, mm. things like that, because I want to, to me, I want to get something out of it where to me, music, it feels like work. You yeah. Know? I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm it, thinking about, oh, how would I, how would I play this song? Would I, you know, would I bolster this section? Would I actually pull back and actually play a lot less? Like the drummers mm. sort of, trying to make up for something, uh, you know, the mock, the joke about too many notes, you know, yeah. I'm going to hit every drum I have, you know, there's something that's interesting though, that I'd love to tail off on in regards to what you just said, which is I recall, and I had to learn this. So I love that you're bringing this up because I think, um, listeners of this show will, will appreciate the depth that you're bringing. Um, and this conversation that we're having, which is to remind everyone that you, and I don't mean you as in just you, but the listener, we're all unique and we all have something that's really powerfully our own. Even if we don't think we have it, everybody else seems to recognize it. Mm. And, and I recall very specifically something similar in a music school where I was, uh, it was actually, I was out of school and I went, um, 
it's a long story, but I was, I was playing, I, I went to this rehearsal hall and I was playing and the, this drummer that I absolutely adored. I mean, he was a drummer for the Commodores. I mean, he was this monster, freaking monster jazz player. Mm. Absolutely. One of the best drummers in the world still teaches up in Pennsylvania and, and I'm, I'm practicing. And I, I think I was even playing um, an old missing person song because I'm a Terry Bozio fan. Right. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm playing something and I see the door just crack open <laughs> a, tiny, a tiny bit. And I'm like, what's, what's that? And then I see a head, you know, do the little <laughs> lean in. And then, and then as soon as I look up, it, it, they pull back and the door closes. Right. Oh, yeah. And then I, so I, I'm back down playing again. And, and then I see two heads lean in a man and a woman. And I'm like, what is going on? So I get up behind the kit and I walk over the door and I open the door really fast and I catch him. Right. And it's the guy, the, the Commodore drummer. Oh yeah. And he's like, holy shit, man. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, he goes, I forgot how good you are. And I'm like, wow. what? You know, like, like, I mean, I just got, my nipples just got hard. to <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, but I mean, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I couldn't believe it. And mm. and I, I imagine with you, it's the same way, even though, you know, you're exceptional, the idea of hearing the word exceptional sounds impossible or arrogant. You well, know? yeah, it's kind of hard to picture yourself in that situation. Sometimes you get on these highs and you feel like you really are in this kind of beautiful moment and you don't want it to ever end. And that's like the best part I think of, uh, I mean, associated with music, although it can happen in other, you know, in all kinds of other circumstances in life. But yeah. those are the things that you kind of live for, you know, where you feel like, okay, like all of this stuff was worth it because of this. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like the nature of, of talent and the idea of, you know, giftedness and all these things that people talk about, it's very, yeah, I have a trouble negotiating with it. I mean, for me, it's kind of like, uh, like I mean, it's this this sort of um, this X factor that's a little bit difficult to to pin down, and it's it's sort of like th these waves that come, and that maybe you know we're somehow um, able to catch them, you know, or sort of be in their presence so that they can move through us. Yeah. Uh, again, that's kind of what I believe in more than sort of being responsible for great, you know. Yeah. work or whatever it's like you know i think it's it's more like well i had my radar dish you know on and like it was capturing what was out there you know i had i had big ears and i was really listening and i think that's like where a lot of great um great ideas and and great art comes from is sort of being open and being yeah. receptive um and uh because a lot of it comes from accidents or um sort of uh things that hit you all of a sudden like uh you know lightning or whatever yeah. and uh yeah it's our job to catch those things yeah. and it's not necessarily for us to hoard them but just to kind of uh be able to transmit the energy back you yeah. know and, and to be able to share that in a way that people can uh receive you know they it's not I mean, music isn't even tangible really it's like you know it's just out there um you know it's, it's just vibration but it's still something that you know it's like a form that human beings can can understand and process on not only like an intellectual level but an emotional level so yeah. um that's like yeah for me that's what it boils down to you know if if you think that what i do is great or if you think it's like absolute shit, you know it's like it's really a matter of i guess what sort of frequency you're you're vibrating on i guess and whether it it, it reaches you or not and you know i don't expect one or the other necessarily you know both are going to happen and um it of course makes you feel good though when when people resonate with it and encourages you to want to do more yeah. and and i you know i appreciate that a lot you know it's always amazing when people say yeah keep it up you know yeah. um but I, I wouldn't stop anyway but it's nice to you know to have the support uh, of people because it's part of this feedback loop that's you know that's so instantaneous in in live performance but of course it happens as well with, uh, you know, with records and it's just, it takes longer. It's like this process of, you know, it's like you've received this thing and you're working on it and you're finding the sculpture and the marble and then you make it. And then, 
um, by the time you've finished making it, it's like old news for you, but then somebody else receives right. it and then it grows on them a little bit and they're not yeah. sure about it. And then, oh yeah, okay, this is now this is clicking. And then it becomes like a classic for them. And then, you know, maybe years later they say, oh, you know, that was, that was amazing. Um, and then you're like, oh, oh, you like this thing. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> for me, I mean, yeah, I, I feel like that's maybe the process of it. And, and there's certain uh, records, for example, that uh, didn't click with me right away. And then I couldn't stop listening to them after. And I think mm -hmm. that's, there's something interesting about that when like something just doesn't hit you and you're like, oh no. And then, yeah. oh yeah. Okay. You know yeah. what I mean? That's so interesting. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you too. There's a, you know, all artists are always, obviously, I think most of us are trying to evolve. Very few of us are thinking about how can we monetize this moment? We're, yeah. we're, we're great. We're grateful when it does, yeah. but we're not necessarily seeking that. Um, and yet the audience wants to hear what they know, mm. not necessarily where you want to take them. Well, that's it, a good point. Yeah. I, I think that when you're, um, when you're at a live show and like, and you hear something that you know really well, I think it's the, the, the question of repetition and something, you know, the more you hear, the more musical it becomes. It's like, if you just hear someone repeating a phrase over and over again, um, after a while you stop hearing the words, but you hear the melody and the, the sort of the lilt and the, the rhythm more and more, yeah. right. It becomes more musical than it is uh, a transmission of ideas. Yeah. And so I really, I, I felt that too, you know, when I've seen artists that I really liked live and they play something that I know very well and it kicks in and it's, it's like the record, but not, but it's like, then what is so imprinted in your mind from hearing the record a lot starts playing simultaneously as you hear them play the music in real time. And it's yeah. like they're happening in tandem, like they're synced up yeah. and that's so cool, you know? And I think, Every human being has that that experience of joy when they hear something live that they know really well from listening to the record, for example. Or it could be the reverse where they've heard it live and then they hear the recording. They go, oh, yeah, it's that one. You yeah. know, it's a feeling yeah. of familiarity and repetition. You know, I, I get you, though. I mean, coming back to because you were talking about sort of trying to evolve and do something new. And of course, yeah, it's harder because, uh, you know, people, they don't have that. In, inside yet they haven't internalized that music yet you know so then that's that's where the uh i think the presence of the performance and uh yeah i guess being able to sort of give what you have to offer in that moment becomes really crucial because uh then people people are able to still as you were saying earlier uh you know they they come away with an emotion and something that it's just a feeling that they get they don't remember all the notes that were played it's it's right. like that's the way you know we experience music whereas when we see things we can remember much more vividly what color this thing was or what this person looked like or uh you know what the shape of something happened to be it's it's much more kind of uh clear to us whereas with sound it it kind of all washes over us but then there's like a feeling and an intention that remains yes. and the, the feeling of these moments that remain. And that's, I mean, super cool, but I think that's kind of, yeah, the nature of it, especially in, in uh, a live setting. Yeah. 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 The feeling resonates in you. It just remains mm -hmm. in you. And, and that's the thumbprint, right? Um, well, I look, I have a million questions, but I got to get to what we're here to talk about, which is out of the ether, right? All right. Um, so this, you just released last Friday, Friday is this past correct? Friday yeah so I mean clearly you're a master improvisational player I mean we we all know this and we've talked about this almost entirely this this show which is great but can you tell me a little bit of uh, excuse me tell me a little story behind you know out of the ether and you know how our listeners can listen to it and where they can find it because I know I already know the answer but I want to yeah you say it <laughs> for sure yeah yeah so this piece was almost actually a little bit of a throwaway thing that I had in the back pocket for a little while. And then I thought, you know, I, I should just release this because normally I, I release longer pieces. Like if you look at the stuff that's on my YouTube channel, for example, on the albums that I've released apart from worlds within, but that's really worlds within is kind of just like one really long composition uh, with these movements, but individual pieces that I write tend to be longer. And this is like exactly three minutes. Um, and the story behind it is that I was actually doing a session for another band 
it was like an extreme metal band and they wanted an interlude uh between two really fast pieces on on their record um and uh so i didn't have any directives as to what to do uh which is very common but it wasn't like okay you know maybe play in this key or do this uh, you know maybe make it build this way or it was just okay uh, just make something so you know i i didn't have a lot of time as is common when you're doing a session particularly in person because this was actually like just before the pandemic um and uh you know when that happens you rely a little bit more on your own uh, sort of personal vocabulary uh sometimes because you you're so pressed for time you're focusing you're recording something right so you need to put something down that um that sounds like album worthy so right i i tend in those situations like if i'm tight on time and someone says okay go do your thing and it's kind of this shred album you know so i was like okay it's it's got to be a little busier it's got to be a little bit more flamboyant in a way a bit more fiery so uh i you know did maybe like three takes and then uh then a different one ended up being on the on the record and then i had this this one left over that i liked um and uh and so i just kind of sat on it for a little while um and uh it was recorded i mean the actual recording was done in uh, the engineer's living room uh wow. and uh yeah so it you know it was just this kind of very informal this setup, is the world I, we live in now <laughs> yeah yeah totally so unfair yeah. so cool I, I mean, yeah, it worked out. So, so this piece uh, has two parts to it. The, the opening is kind of like this. Um, it's this very kind of Middle Eastern sounding sort of like supplication um, with this very lamenting voice, um, and it uses quarter tones, which is very common, you know, in Middle Eastern music. And um, I'm very, I feel very connected to to Persian music in particular, and have played with uh, you know many different you know Iranian musicians, and uh, so this uh this opening kind of draws a bit more on that style um and it's just got this kind of sort of uh tense drone in the background uh, but then it has this yeah this feeling of um sort of pain and loss at the beginning but it's also like this sort of introduction and then it goes into these sort of rolling arpeggios and then the second half is really kind of built around that it's uh, it's fast it's kind of a bit free but it's yeah it's based around these these fast arpeggios and these different chord shapes um and some fast runs um but again it has this yeah this free feeling to it uh very reflective and then it has a sort of um yeah like almost like cadenza like run at the end and ends up on this uh almost like a dissonant chord right so we're in you know for the the music nerds it's uh, it's basically this this second part is in phrygian and we end on the flat 2 in phrygian and oh it just God. it just lands there <laughs> with this like um pan delay thing you know so yeah it's yeah. just kind of this this chaotic cliffhanger ending um wow. but it kind of makes you want to go back to the start and hear it again because it doesn't just sort of um have this soft landing that you might expect um and uh and yeah so so then you know we shot this video also we're very fortunate um there's a, a theater um very close to my home uh where uh you know they're basically just letting artists use the space uh oh. for free uh during the pandemic so they can do videos and live streams uh and uh you know it looked really good and i think uh it was cool we were able to sort of a stage a really interesting concept the guy i work with on my videos um he does a lot of really creative things and and one of the, the things that he did for this was to make it feel a bit more like a super 8 film mm -hmm. almost like you're watching a movie on a projector because you're in this theater already so you know the opening shot you know it shows the the lights and it's kind of like these old chandeliers in there and then just you know i'm walking on on stage and then sticking the end pin in the floor and then you know taking a, a breath and then starting to to really try to kind of recreate that feeling of a show um and this this spontaneous experience like this guy just walks into a, a dark theater and then just plays this thing and that's that's it you know oh, and so i, I like how it played into the um the sort of the spontaneity of the piece and how this thing just sort of fell out you know and you just happen to be there to witness the you know the performance because you you know you're sort of a fly on the wall you know yeah. in the theater so that's i guess a summation of of what this thing is and and it's on all the platforms so i 
um i've got a Bandcamp page um, yes. and i've got it up on there and it's on spotify and it's on uh, apple music itunes and it's on youtube of course the video is on my youtube channel um so it's basically yeah available on whichever is your, your preferred platform yeah yeah man i mean that's awesome i love it you know i mean i i've commented on a lot of your stuff of course online and i think it's clear that i i've made it clear i should say today that i really, i really love it i think it's because of the the percussive aspect of it mm, the yeah. resonance of the of the instrument i like how you're creating these loops these sort of uh rhythmic and melodic ostinatos right Some really really cool stuff Thanks. um yeah yeah you know uh so i have a buddy his name is scott adams and scott uh did a tour uh, with uh, with uh, Slash back in the '90s, and also a, a tour with Ann Wilson. He's a sax player, mm. and uh, he's a fan of yours. Oh, and amazing. yeah, yeah. And I was talking to him this morning, and I said, "Hey, I'm going to talk to Rafael today. What question would you ask him?" And he and he. So I have to read it off my thing. It says, "Okay, seems there's a recent surge of acoustic classical instruments in heavy music. What do you think is driving that?" Ah, great question. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think that heavy music has always been actually, um, despite the fact that it's um, it's very specific in its aesthetic, it's also incre incredibly wide ranging. And people who like heavy music, you know, metal and prog and all the different sort of um, offshoots are people who are much more dedicated to music fandom and yeah. music appreciation than almost anybody else. You know what yeah. I mean? They're like the best fans to have, really. Um, they just have such a like an insatiable appetite for all kinds of things. And I've been making, you know, I grew up uh, listening to metal and actually composing metal music. And uh, I, it's really where I started. And that's what I expected to do is to have like a full fledged, you know, like a prog death band and to do that kind of stuff. And I started <laughs> making, I started making that kind of music, you know, as, as a teenager and yeah. then and then, but you know, I, I went to university to play cello. So I, I got really busy playing cello and uh, I started playing in groups, you know, playing cello. And, but I always had this, this metal side of me that just kind of worked its way into everything. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on a bit of a tangent here, but I'm coming back. So okay. a, lot of, a lot of my projects, you know, um, don't really sound like metal at all in a way, but they're what people, a lot of people, I guess in, um, music journalism call metal adjacent. So for example, you know, uh, my group, The Visit, like it was all music that um, I was really inspired by, yeah, kind of extreme metal um, and was trying to sort of uh, replicate that um, with with cello. And, you know, it's got this kind of epic vibe with uh, really intense female vocals, but it's like chamber music. And, you know, but I was listening to like Animals as Leaders and Cloud Kicker and Meshuggah and like, you know, and Tesseract, yeah. like those types of bands that were really influencing me at that time. Um, those are more prog bands, but also a lot of, yeah, a lot more like death metal and stuff. So there's a lot of really fast bowing. And um, it was kind of this like, yeah, very similar to drumming in a way, you know, that type of metal drumming with a lot of double bass. Um, but yeah, so a lot of metal media embraced what we did and understood the aesthetic. And actually our first album, it's really funny because, you know, we have this black and white cover and it's like the liner notes are all black and white and it it looks very stark you know we're we're here in ottawa and it's like full on winter and just snow everywhere and so um and 2015 when you know when it came out in 2015 it was a funny year because it was like a big year for uh, black metal so we got lumped in with all of these black metal releases which was never really anything that i had expected and similarly you know with my group muskox like we've always played this you know chamber folk music yeah, has I'm certain sure. heavy moments but really it's more aesthetically connected with metal and uh, you know through the association associations we have with with sort of maybe similar groups in the scene yeah. so uh and and with a lot of my solo work it's a similar thing so um i think that there's always been this openness to other uh musical forms or other expressions of heaviness um and i love that you know and it's really exciting to be able to make music that's largely acoustic or, you know, being played on a, a non-metal instrument per se, and uh, to be able to still connect with that audience and uh, to be able to contribute to that canon in a way, um, yeah. it feels refreshing. But then on the flip side, coming back to what we were talking about, I think that 
so metal, of course, is a kind of a maximalist style by nature. It's about things being bigger and, you know, more epic and heavier and faster and slower and, you know, uh, more punishing and, uh, you know, all of these types of things. It's, it's kind of more about more than it is about less, basically. And it's about um, trying to raise the stakes. And, uh, you know, there's degrees of sort of athleticism involved in the playing. And, um, and I think just it's very grandiose by nature and very yeah. in your face. And, but there's a ceiling to that. I mean, you can only get so heavy really, or so yeah. fast before it just becomes actually ridiculous, you know, or where you're at a point where like your, your <laughs> album is just, it's like, you know, you're at 11 all the time. Yeah. And this is something that I always found difficult to handle with certain groups is that there's sort of a sense of like, okay, there's no dynamics in this music. Like, yeah, okay, the first three tracks are bangers. And then, okay, now I want something a little different, you know, yeah. in the same way that if you listen to a classical uh, symphony or sonata, you would get like a fast movement and then a slow movement and then a fast movement. Um, you wouldn't just get like three fast <laughs> movements you know, yeah, or yeah. three slow movements necessarily. Um, it's like, you need that contrast to create excitement. Or, you know, if you're watching a movie and, the movie uh, opens with its most intense scene, and then it's just dialogue afterwards. You're like, okay, I want to, I want to see another intense scene. Like, why'd you put the car chase at the beginning, but you didn't have one later in the movie? Yeah. You know, yeah. um, it's like so. Um, I think that uh, that using other instruments that are unusual is like not only essential um, to creating a, a you know a sort of an evolution in this style of music. I, I, but I think it's like it's very desirable for a lot of people who um, are involved in, in making that kind of music because they're already open minded yeah. um, and they already are after other sounds. And they're just voracious for, for new music and it doesn't have to be metal, you know, but I think that there's also a new generation that um, grew up listening to heavy music, but uh, maybe they, you know, they just play classical music or they, you know, they play other instruments or something like that. So there's a lot of people that know both worlds well enough that um, they're able to function. It's like sort of being able to speak different languages very fluently and just kind of go between the two um, or multiple languages or, you know, what have you. Yeah. I think that um, that, you know, all these factors are contributing to that. But ultimately like metal has always been about evolution. It's always been moving forward. And, um, and I think that in the, in the tens in particular, like kind of got to a point where like the, the level of perfectness in, in uh, the sound of the yes. mixes and the saturation of the guitars and like, uh, it's sort of hit a ceiling, you know, it's like, yeah, everything's loud. Yeah. Everything's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like a square wave. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the drums a lot of times sound like they could be programmed, you know, a lot of times guitar. they are. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times they are exactly. Yeah, or they're yeah. completely sound replaced. So yeah. you're not he hearing the real tones. Um, so I think that there's a, been a move away from that in the last decade. Um, because also that way of producing has become so much easier now with like, you know, you've got like neural DSP and you've got like get good drums. You have all these, uh, these sample packs and stuff that sound really good. Like you could sound like any bigger band almost yeah. with this yeah. stuff. So it's not even so much about, do you sound like professional anymore? It's, it's about timbre and, uh, you know, uh, identity and, and being unique with, yeah, the, the types of timbres you use and, and, you know, your ability to compose interesting songs, right. you have to, you know, you have to be able to do that. And I think a big part of, um, why a lot of groups have have evolved in another direction in recent years is because of that this feeling of like reaching a saturation point in the in the metal aesthetic and you see it a lot you know um, obviously Leprous is a great example of a band that completely moved away from that and and it's like if you listen to the last couple of albums um, you know everything's much more organic and um, there's a lot of things like, you know, on, on pitfalls, for example, the drums, like being actually a little bit off the click and having right. maybe a little bit behind the beat. A little and, imperfect. Yeah, exactly. But it, it, it actually feels really good, you know, to have that. It's like, yeah, that's how records were made before, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's like this sliding around the, the beat or just having, you know, having real instruments, like having real strings. I mean, I, I can't stand, you know, like just oh, yeah. kind of the orchestrations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> for me, like, I, you know, uh. I, I could never use those things because, first of all, I mean, 
you know, I, I play the instrument for a living. So it's like, that's what I do in records anyway, but it's just so hard for me to listen to it because I know that that's not a real sound, you yeah. know, and it doesn't really evoke emotion for me. It sounds huge and bombastic, yeah. but it doesn't, um, it's just like, okay, now you're like using this string plugin or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know? you can hear the sample, you can hear the modulation, you can hear the predictability of the modulation. It doesn't have any human feel to it at all. No, no, not at all. So, uh, you know, of course that's a choice, like in some types of music, certain things that are more processed and uh, more digital are, are, you know, desirable aesthetically. But I think, again, bands are making interesting moves consciously to uh, use those things to enhance the composition, not as a sort of a crutch or this feeling that, oh, the industry is in this place right now, so we should be doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot about like the, the latest uh, Pain of Salvation record and like the way there's like use of auto-tune that isn't meant, you know, in the way that you would hear it on the radio normally. It's like, it's really beautiful the way, the way he uses it. And, and then there's like, there's stuff that's very programmed sounding, but it's actually, it's actually guitars just, being affected a lot um, or, you know, the actual drums themselves that actually have a very raw sound, but yeah. it's really awesome. It hits really hard. I really love his choices and with what he does, you know, uh, on the record, like there's so many, so many cool things happening in the production, you know, vocal layering, like all this stuff. Um, it's just like ear candy. But again, I can tell that it's being done by a band that has like so many years of experience. They're making artistic choices, not just kind of going with, uh, what's happening this decade, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, dude, I, I am blown away by the time you've given me today. You, oh, pleasure. You, you've been so thoughtful and so precise and so on the money. And you remember the questions I ask. <laughs> <laughs> so what's amazing is I'll ask you something and then you'll have this, like you said, tangential thing, and then you'll come back to it. Um, I can't do that. So you're, you're a brilliant man. Um, uh, is there anything that you'd like to share maybe that I haven't asked yet? Because, I mean, you know, again, with the new release coming out and, of course, the other things, you keep yourself very busy. You mentioned Muskox a second ago, which I really, really like as well. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, what What else is coming? And then we'll, we'll close. Okay. So um, I will mention one thing that's important that I haven't really announced yet, oh, um, wow. but uh, I'm going to announce very soon. So... Um, I'm releasing a live album of uh, my my first uh, solo record, Worlds Within. So it's right. a it's a full live uh, performance, obviously from a, a lockdown a situation. So you know, without with no audience, but uh, yeah, and it's all filmed uh, in high quality um, at this uh, wow. Woodland Studio that I work at in the country. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's it's like a new take on a record that I've already made. The cover art is up there. Um, and uh, like from what I can see, it's yeah, yeah. So that's well. This is for the the original album. These are the original paintings uh, that were used for the front and back cover, uh, and and so this is like uh, sort of it's sort of the you know recreating something that was already enjoyable to make and felt you know good to listen to at the end. But it's it's sort of a different approach because uh, we made the studio album not necessarily knowing exactly how it was going to turn out and. Um, working with multi-tracking, right? So I would, you know, play to a click. Uh, I had the different layers worked out. So I would, I would play through each one, maybe do like a full pass of a section or create like a four, you know, four cycles and make a loop because it's based around live looping. But then after finishing the record, I mean, I hadn't really planned on performing it live, but there seemed to be a lot of demand to play this music live. So I thought, okay, I have to do a show. So you know, I had some release shows in early 2020 and I forced myself to learn how to play the album. And it was very wow. challenging to figure out the routing with the looping and stuff, but I managed to work it out. And then it became actually one of my favorite things to play. So even through the pandemic, I've had a chance to, to play it in like small live settings and, and uh, on live streams in its entirety. And it's been really fun. And, uh, so I um, I ended up just uh, deciding okay I want to just record the whole thing in you know in good quality but as a as a live version doing it the way I do it um, in a in a concert setting uh, using the loop pedal and and using the uh, the guitar amp and um, and of course blending the the amp signal and the the clean acoustic sound 
in a similar way to how we did the record because we we are using amplified sounds on the record oh, um yeah. so so that's like a big part of what you hear actually it's quite predominant um throughout so um yeah so it's been a really different experience though kind of recreating it and uh trying to find um a, a similar sound but also different uh, yeah. it has a bit more immediacy you know uh, there's certain parts where i i take solos in places that aren't on the record and i do things that are a little bit different so i think for people who are already fans of that album it's going to be probably interesting to be able to compare them and, and hear these different approaches um but it wasn't without its challenges certainly to record it uh live off the floor and get everything all these different layers balanced in a way that's comparable to the record um quite tricky but uh i'm really i'm really uh, excited to share that so that's going to come out awesome. um in early july and awesome. uh it'll be a digital release but there's going to be four long videos uh of me playing the whole thing so uh so that's something that's coming yeah quite yeah. soon awesome well i promise i'm gonna do everything i can you know and help you sell it all <laughs> Thanks. But uh, I, I really want to stay in touch with you because I would love to have you. I mean, just selfishly. So I want to just say this now in front of everybody. Um, I want to. I want to host a show for you if you can ever come back through Seattle. Oh, yeah. um, I have a couple of uh, friends who own theaters and oh, wow. you know and you know spaces. Um, also, a couple of incredible restaurants that actually hold like 200, 300 people, hmm. where we could do we could basically close off the place and do a show wow. and yeah so i'd love to feature you if you'd consider that down the road and and a lot of my listeners live in the seattle area it makes sense i have a lot of friends here and a lot of music industry people um so it would just be a special thing so you know consider it um definitely would be a pleasure yeah yeah and i'll tell all my listeners just you know please you know rafael's a massive talent and if you haven't heard it yet you're going to be blown away. I'm definitely going to toss something on the show here so people can hear some of your work. Um, I don't monetize my show, so this is not about me. I won't steal your material. No, um, no. But go buy his record. Go buy his records. Go listen to all of his work um, because the man is tired <laughs> 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 and, uh, and deserves your attention because, like you said, I think people really, truly recognize beautiful things. It may not necessarily be what they traditionally listen to, but the thing that I'm discovering is, is that I'm, I'm gaining, uh, I'm getting people to consider that the complexities of say a progressive piece or, you know, a, a, a metal piece isn't, isn't equated with dumb guy syndrome, right? It's very thoughtful material. There's a lot going on, but that's supposed, it's supposed to challenge you. It, 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 yeah. it, it, it elevates you and your music elevates people so thank you Raphael. it's 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 wonderful it's wonderful thank you really appreciate it it's been yeah. such a pleasure to chat and uh yeah such a nice opportunity i really appreciate it thanks for having me